When we take a picture with a camera, we usually don't control the lighting. But by simply adding a projector to provide structured illumination, and with some computer vision concepts, we can do remarkable things. Create images from new perspectives without moving the camera, or even measure depth information. In my last video, I showed how to reconstruct images of objects that were out of sight from a single photo detector. It's time to switch out that single pixel detector for a 2D camera. I'll be using this Raspberry Pi camera. The first part of this video will be based on some more results from the dual photography paper I described last time, and then I'll go into range finding. Let's set up a scene with a projector and camera. If I fully illuminate the scene, this is the image I acquire from the camera. In order to implement the ideas in dual photography, we need to capture the light transport information in the system. In other words, we need to figure out the mapping between each pixel of the projector and the camera. When all the projector pixels are on, the whole scene is illuminated and you can't tell which projector pixels correspond to a pixel on the camera. If I illuminate the scene with one small square from the projector, we'll call this one illumination pixel, and capture a photo, I can describe the mapping between that one projector pixel and the corresponding pixels on the camera. But that's just one point. I could scan the entire scene one point at a time and collect an image for each illumination point, but that would require a ton of images. So what's routinely done in the literature is to encode each illumination pixel by using binary coded structured light. I think this is such a cool idea. I'll take some time explaining it, so hold on for a dive into details before the results. I'll explain it using an illumination pattern with only four by four pixels. If we did one point at a time, that would be 16 images. Instead, we give each pixel a binary code. For 16 pixels, that requires four bits. Each bit corresponds to a different illumination pattern. If a value equals one, then that illumination pixel is turned on for that pattern. And if it's zero, then it's off. So for the 4x4 four four illumination pattern, we need to illuminate the scene with four patterns. I've color-coded each bit to help visualize this. We illuminate the scene with these patterns, and the camera images are saved onto a computer. So how do we figure out the light transport information? Consider this illumination pixel I marked with a red box. It has the binary code 0110 which means it was only on during the second and third pattern in the sequence. The algorithm searches for all the camera pixels that only received light from the scene during the second and third pattern. Here are the camera pixels found by the algorithm. Because each illumination pixel has a unique binary code in the sequence, we know these camera pixels must correspond to that single illumination pixel. Okay, let's actually try this out. I created the sequence for 256 by 256 pixel illumination patterns. With the binary coded technique, I only needed 16 images plus a frame with full illumination. This saves an immense amount of time and storage compared to point scanning. The scene is illuminated with these patterns and images are captured with the Pi camera. The images needed to be processed to generate binary mass that correspond to each illumination pattern. A key step here is to normalize all the images with respect to the fully illuminated scene. For example, this black switch is especially difficult to threshold. Now when I select specific illumination pixels, let's say this patch here, I look up the binary values for those pixels and search the data set for the camera pixels that match the binary sequence. That's one small square, but I have the information for any illumination pixel. So even though I never collected the thousands of images required for point scanning the scene, I can create them using the data from only 16 images. Because we have the light transport information, we're actually free to synthetically illuminate the scene with any pattern. I just upload an image, resize it to the same illumination pattern dimensions, 
and then turn on the camera pixels that correspond to the illumination pixels in the pattern. I never illuminated the scene with any of these patterns that you're seeing, but we know the light transport between the projector and camera so we can construct these images. I can make videos with different illumination sequences like this countdown. I got this working well enough for a demo, but it's kind of hacked together. I think the big problem is that I didn't follow the method for optimizing the illumination patterns, so there's lots of mistakes in assigning camera pixels. Still, it's a fascinating result to replicate. Check out the results from the dual photography paper in comparison. You've got to appreciate the work put into this idea and perfecting the result. So far, I've only shown images from the perspective of the camera. But another key idea in the paper is the reconstruction of images from the perspective of the projector. I showed this result using a single photo detector in my last video. No matter where we place the photo detector, the reconstructed image was from the perspective of the projector. But how do we do this with a camera? Well, we actually already have all the information we need from the light transport. If an illumination pixel hits the scene and gets collected by the camera over n pixels, we know the signal over those n camera pixels corresponds to that one projector pixel. So all we have to do is average those camera pixels and store them in a new image. If we repeat the averaging procedure for every illumination pixel, we reconstruct an image from the perspective of the projector. Isn't that neat? It's as if the projector took a photo. I set up another scene at night outside my little IKEA optical enclosure to try more objects. I captured the 16 images to do the binary encoded point scan and calculated the light transport. Here's the perspective from the camera, and here is the reconstructed perspective from the projector. It's not perfect by any means, but you get the idea. The shadows cast in the dual photo are my favorite part, especially this cat shadow. Lastly, I took a self-portrait, because why not? Here's the perspective from the camera, the structured illumination and binary mass, and finally, the dual photo reconstruction. It's kind of eerie, but it still kind of works. When I first saw this photo, I was reminded of a sculpture by Romuek I saw a long time ago, and his work has always stuck with me, clearly. I mean, look at that resemblance, yeah. Anyway, thought that was interesting. So this dual photography paper was published about 20 years ago. Nowadays, the words synthetic image and video generation are way more commonly known. We usually think about deep learning techniques that use large amounts of training data. I'm not an expert in computer vision and deep learning, and the work presented here is based on a physical model of ray tracing, not data-driven methods. But as I was starting to get into the synthetic illumination, I wanted to learn more about how researchers are addressing the evolution of generative AI for images. I've linked a review that was a really helpful starting point for me. It provided a brief history and different types of generative AI, as well as the ethics of this work and recommendations for regulation to help prevent the harmful things it could be used for. Definitely check it out if you're interested in generative AI. All right, with that, let's get back to some imaging. There's one more application I want to cover in this video with the 2D sensor and structured illumination, and that's depth measurement of the scene, also known as range finding. If you're unfamiliar with this concept, Professor Shri Nair's YouTube channel on computer vision has a fantastic explanation. The entire lecture series is essential for anyone interested in this field. I've learned a lot watching them. I'll briefly explain the idea here. 3D information is lost when we usually take a photo of a scene that is broadly illuminated. Our perception and experience with the 3D world enables us to interpret distance in a scene qualitatively, but it's possible to directly measure depth using structured illumination. Imagine a plane of illumination intersecting a scene, light reflecting off the scene, and then getting collected onto a camera. If you work out the geometry, then you can determine the 3D information based on the following equation. 
where a, b, c, and d are constants to describe the equation of the illumination plane, f is the effective focal distance of the camera, and x and y are coordinates on the camera sensor. To illuminate the scene with many lines of illumination, we use the same binary encoding technique as before. For 128 illumination planes, I generated seven images with binary encoding, plus the full illumination frame. Here are the 128 reconstructed images, each with a different line of illumination, all generated from only eight images. I know there must be a better way to calibrate the setup, but the way I solved the equation for reconstruction required that I measure a few distances in my system to establish the coordinate system. The dimensions marked with green dashed lines are the ones I needed to measure in order to calculate the equation of the light plane. The three points in the plane I measured were the ones marked here, which can be expressed by the dimensions shown in the previous layout. The results can then be visualized using a heat map or overlaying the original image so that the object pops out of the screen. Implementing this idea seemed like a bit of magic to me when I first saw the results, so I tried several different objects and scenes. After acquiring just eight images, I can reconstruct the depth map. The bluer the object, the closer it is to the camera, and the redder it is, the farther away it is. In this scene, the screw terminal block is out in front, followed by the black push button, and the knitting needle is pointing in the direction of the camera. The wall with the OCO logo is slanted relative to the camera. All these trends are captured in the depth map. You can see some stripe artifacts and features of the cat's face and black switch not being correctly mapped due to errors and binarization of the input images. But it was nice to see the piece of paper with the OCO logo, which has black letters, completely drop out of the depth map and match the wall depth. To really capture how amazing this concept is, I placed these wooden blocks at different distances relative to the camera. When you look at the image captured by the camera, it's not easy to infer depth information because there's not a lot of useful structure or shadows. But the reconstructed depth map can tell what's going on. In this technique, the number of illumination planes used is equal to the depth resolution. What's really impressive is that the spatial resolution is determined by the resolution of the camera sensor. I did have to make some adjustments to the parameters so that I got depth values that made sense, but theoretically we could get accurate depth measurements from this technique but my results are more qualitative and I wouldn't trust the actual values in millimeters I have here. I never confirm distances with calipers or anything. I love that this technique doesn't have any moving parts, but it's also a limitation. The shadows prevent depth measurement over the entire scene. So usually 3D scanning requires the part or camera to be rotated. Alex from the Super Make Something channel has a terrific build of a low-cost 3D scanner using single-point measurements from, I can't believe it, almost 10 years ago when at-home 3D scanning was far less popular. Today, photogrammetry is probably the most popular technique for 3D scanning at home. For example, the Teaching Tech channel has a nice overview of an open-source 3D scanner that uses this technique. Apps for 3D scanning with smartphones are also available. I tried this out for the first time just to mention it in this video, and the results looked pretty good, especially given that I took only 20 photos without much thought and without using LiDAR. All that being said about 3D scanning without a projector, one of my friends did point out that Kiens offers a structured light scanner. I wonder what tricks and innovations are behind that piece of technology. Before closing out this video, I have a bit of an update for OCO Optics. After making videos on projects for over eight years, I've decided to launch a YouTube membership and Patreon for my channel. I'm not crazy about making pitches like this, but it's also an exciting step for these projects. If you'd like to get a look behind the scenes, hear about projects before I launch videos, or just want to support the work, 
consider joining. Your support means a lot and will help fund more ambitious projects in the future. Well, it's been a lot of fun working on these computational imaging concepts. If you're looking for a throwback, I have another video on photogrammetry and optical computed tomography that's similar to some of the ideas I presented here. My next project will be on an entirely new imaging concept, so stay tuned and thanks for watching.